So class number four is going to be your identity in Christ's humility. Can I say that again? Your identity in Christ's humility. And then we're going to talk briefly about how prophecy calls forth your identity. How does that sound? So we'll start out with your identity in Christ's humility, and it's customary for me to do a very quick review of the first few weeks, so I want to do that. Um, The very first night, we talked about how you were created. Let me see if I can get an answer. Why were you created? What? For God's pleasure. What's, what would be another phrase? You were created because God enjoys you. Yeah, and we talked about how with, uh, in an earthly example of a husband and wife, that they enjoy each other so much that a conception occurs so that they can enlarge their family so that there is someone to enjoy. And then they dote over that baby when the baby has done nothing to deserve it. They've, the baby is actually a, a huge imposition of their lifestyle, right? But there is tremendous grace in the parents to delight in that little baby, which is exactly the way, the reason that God created man and the way he feels about you. And then the second week we talked about God redeemed you because... Because he enjoys you. And the chapter was Luke chapter 15. And 10 or 11 times in Luke chapter 15, we see the subject of rejoicing, don't we? It's because God can't contain his joy when he restores relationship with lost sons. And he sees the human race not as disgusting sinners, Because he's provided the remedy for sin before sin occurred. So he comes to to humans that are in sin. He's not intimidated by their sin because he's got the remedy. Does that make sense? And so he comes with sin's remedy. And rather than keep them locked up in shame and sin, he wants to remove it from them. And then his sentiment is utter delight when he restores relationship with a lost son because he's, he wants to just invite you and I to the party. The destination point for every lost son is to be in a party with God. And that party is depicted in Proverbs chapter 8 if you remember back to the party that occurred in heaven during creation. The Father and the Son were experiencing so much delight that heaven's workshop during the process of creation looked more like a party scene than a workshop. And so I believe that in the prodigal son story, that killing the fatted calf and then rejoicing greatly because relationship has been restored is actually a picture of heaven's party that the human race has been invited back into. So then last week, we talked about Psalm 139. We focused on that. And we wanted to go specifically and take the fact that God enjoys you and make it personal. That was the, that was the objective of last week. And so we used the, um, what version of the Bible did we, we, not miss it, passion version of Psalm 139. And I think paraphrases are helpful for devotional study. Uh, They're not necessarily helpful for for hard Bible study because you want want word-for-word translations. But when you want to personalize the scripture, um, I think paraphrases, and and especially the Psalms, this version, Passion and the Psalms, um, it helps me to connect with the heart of God using language that can sort of awaken who I am so I can personalize the scripture. Because we don't want to just intellectually learn more about God. We want to personalize the scripture so that we can fully engage our heart in it, right? 
We don't want it to just be an intellectual exercise. And so we, we need to personalize it. And then we, we raise your hand, Neil. We, we honor this man for being epic in his ability to personalize the Psalms. You know, it, he, he is actually starting a blog, or I want you to get his, well, not yet, but he, I want you to share your email address with him because he is now coming up with poetry and material based on the Psalms that is so good, and he's willing to share it with the body of Christ. And uh, so we, we're grateful for, for Neil's example of what it looks like when you take truth and personalize it in a deep way so that it changes your heart. And some of that poetry, Neil, you know, let me just say, when I hike with Neil, sometimes in the middle of the hike, we will lay down at, at, in, in some secret areas of Elfin Forest Reserve. We have some little secret hiking spots that I could show you, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> and we lay down there, and he just starts reading his poetry from the Psalms. And I just, oh, I'm just, it's just, it's, it's a state of bliss. So there are certain people that can, that can provide an example for a deep devotional life as they personalize scripture. And I just think it's good for the body of Christ to honor such people. Another person we're going to honor later tonight is Mike Hubbard, sitting in the front row here, who has used a different method to personalize scripture. That is, he's taken his prophetic words and compiled his prophetic words into a concise identity statement. So, so it's something that he can say over and over again because your prophetic words are God's view of who you are, aren't they? And so, and so that's going to be your only assignment in this class. Your only homework assignment is going to be to take your prophetic words. Raise your hand if you have any. And if not, we're going to pray over you. Okay, so... so and, and I want you to put your prophetic words out in front of you. And Mike will be talking about that later. But, but compile an identity statement where you can say out loud in agreement with what God is saying about you. It's another way of personalizing the scripture. All right, so that's my review. Are we all, are we all on the same page? Um, so we're going to talk about your identity in Christ's humility. Because in the last few sessions, we've been talking about your identity as the object of God's joy. N nod your head if you're starting to get that. Your identity as the object of God's joy. But there's another dimension of your identity. Um, and we're going to talk about that. Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 5 says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Now, can I stop right there? What do you think it's talking about? What is the subject of Philippians 2? What, what mind of Christ does he want in you? What do you think the subject of this whole chapter is going to be about? It's, it's about humility. So when it says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ, it's saying that you possess the identity of humility that the Son of God does, right? Because we're predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. And so, and when he redeemed us, he gave us a new nature, and we now have the spiritual DNA of, of the last Adam, not the first Adam. Are you with me? Your, your true nature right now, having been born again, is that you're, you have the nature of Christ. You have the flawless nature of Christ now. Can I say that? You don't express it flawlessly yet, but, but right now you possess it. So can you say, I possess it even if I don't fully express it? If you... If, if, if you don't think you possess it, you'll never be able to express it. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. 
It, belief precedes behavior. Yeah. So, so I'm saying to you that the flawless nature of the Son of God is something that he has given to you. If any man be in Christ, who's that? Raise your hand if that's... If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. So you bear the nature of Christ, but that includes the humility of Christ. So you are the object of the Father's joy as much as Jesus is. To the same degree that the Father loves Jesus, Jesus loves you. You are not a second-class citizen in the kingdom. So, but, the, but also to the same degree that Jesus displays humility, if you have his nature, then we derive our identity from Christ's humility. Now, let me just say this. How many would say, male and female, that I'm a son of God? Right. So, and how many would raise your hand if you would say, the Father feels joy for me, the, the same way that he feels joy for Jesus, okay? That's true. So, your relationship with the Father is that you're a son. Is that correct? You're a son. Your relationship with the Father is not you're a servant. You are not a servant in relationship to the Father, you are a servant to the world. Does that make sense to you? You are a son of God. And you are full of all the dignity and all the Father's delight is yours. But just like Jesus, we are willing to take off the royal robe, which I would picture as a purple robe around my shoulder, you know, when the prodigal son returned, there was an exchange of garments, wasn't there? He had been wallowing in the pigsty. And so he was full of mud and the father exchanged garments and put, I think, a purple robe around his, uh, just around his torso. And, and so that purple robe is God saying, I remove shame from lost sons, and I give you all the dignity. I, I remove shame, I remove sin, and I give you dignity, and I give you all the privileges of the son. Not a servant, a son. So think of the prodigal son draped in a purple robe. What were some of the other things that the prodigal son was given by the father besides the robe? Does anyone remember? There was a ring put on his finger. What does that signify? The signet ring is, is, is a picture of authority in Scripture. So what happened is the prodigal son went off and wasted himself in self-indulgent living. And the father then removes his shame, puts on the royal robe, places his dignity and royalty back on the son and also restores his authority as a son. That's the signet ring. The one other item he gave him, you remember? He gave, he gave him sandals for his feet. So what does scripture say about uh, your feet? In, in, in uh, Ephesians chapter six, what what? Your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So two of the items that the father gave the son were a restoration of the son's dignity, a removal of sin, but also a, 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 a completely giving the son, restoring the, son, uh, the father's authority to the son. But the shoes are somewhat different. The shoes are equipping the son in partnership with the Father to go out and become a servant to mankind and reach the lost. So two of the items that were given the Son were a restoration of the Son's identity. And one of the items 
was an invitation. The shoes were an invitation to go on the quest in partnership with the Father to reach more lost sons. Does that make sense? The shoes on your feet mean you, you can be on the move with God. Because God doesn't just love you as an individual, he loves other lost sons, and he's giving shoes to your feet to partner with him in his quest to reach the hurting and broken. That's, that's part of your identity. The shoes are as much part of your identity as the restoration of dignity and authority. Are you with me? So that's why we're talking about our identity in Christ's humility because Christ was willing to be a servant and in doing so, he doesn't lose the dignity of being a son. Are you with me? So it's as a, almost like this. Can you, Clyde, can you hold this for me when, when I do this demonstration? I just need you to hold the mic. Okay, so st stand to the side of me if you would. So I have a comforter right here that's purple. So I'm going to wrap this around me. And I, uh, this is a picture of the restoration of Dignity and the rest, you know, think of me as a ring on my finger, the restoration of authority. And so every lost son, which is all of us, is draped in this royal robe. Our true identity is we are the object of the father's joy. All shame has been removed and all sin has been removed. And it's been something the father has done for us and we couldn't do on our own. We had to just bring that down a little bit. We had nothing to bring to the table to negotiate with God to get him to love us. We were bankrupt in our ability to impress God to get him to love us. The love that we experience and the restoration of authority and dignity comes because of who God is, not because of who we are. Okay, so you're with me there. So, so this represents dignity, royalty, and I'm the object of the Father's joy. I'm invited into the party because, because Daddy absolutely delights in me. So that's, that is your identity. Now, you're also invited as a son of God to do what Jesus did, and that is remove the royal robe from your shoulders and wrap it around your waist as an apron. This apron signifies becoming a servant. Does that make sense? So what did Jesus do when he washed the disciples' feet? He took up the basin and the towel and he put an apron on and he makes the, the, the decision to become a servant. In, in becoming a servant does he lose the dignity and royalty of being a son? No. Does, does it change his relationship with the father? Does, no. He's still the object of the father's delight, but he is making the choice to be a servant of mankind. So are you, are you getting this? You are a son of God, and you are full of God's dignity, but you also have your identity based in his humility where you're willing to remove the royal garments, take up the basin and the towel and wash people's feet. In doing so, you don't lose your dignity. You actually gain dignity. I believe so. Because Jesus was the suffering servant and what does scripture say? The greatest among you shall be the servant of all. So in choosing to be a servant, he actually, he actually deserves greater glory because who among us knows a king that was willing to become a janitor? Who, 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 do you know anyone like that? Do you know anyone that was a CEO of Microsoft that would be willing to become a janitor because he loves people? Well, I'm telling you that the, the, the choice that Christ made as God, the, the, the humility that it took to become a man and then be crucified by the ones that he came to save, 
That humility is epic. That is beyond comprehension that the Son of God would, would, would remove the garments of dignity, leave the ivory tower in heaven, and put on the apron to serve mankind. Are, are you with me? I'm saying you are defined by that identity as well. Thank you. We're going to do more. We're going to do more with this, uh, with this purple thing. So I'm back. Um, I'm in Philippians 2, and I want to read vi- verses 5 and 6, but I want to read it in the message version. So it says, Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but he didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantage of that status no matter what. But he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. So Jesus voluntarily laid aside divine privilege, divine position, divine dignity. He laid aside reputation. He laid aside his nobility and he became a bondservant to mankind. Does it, it, this, this humility of Christ, knowing that he is God, he is in his pre-incarnate glory, he has no beginning. He's the uncreated God that made the decision to become a man and then to become crushed by the, by the wrath of God to restore relationship with man. I mean, I will never stop being mind blown by the humility of Christ. In fact, that is, that the, the humility of Christ, I believe, is what inspires all worship in heaven. He is the lamb that is on the throne. He is the lamb. He was defenseless on the way, of the, way to the cross. He refused to defend himself. And he is now the lamb upon the throne. And what are they doing? What is heaven doing in, in Revelation chapter five, 4 and 5? They are prostrating themselves before his throne. The mind-blown elders are casting their crowns before him because they realize that the king that deserved all dignity was willing to take the shame of mankind upon himself and become a servant and, and not even say one word to defend himself on the way to the cross. So he made himself, Philippians chapter 2, 7, of no reputation, taking on the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men. And he didn't become a servant in his relationship with the father. He did not lose his identity as the beloved son and neither do you. But this divine king was willing to become a humble servant of mankind. God was willing to become a baby. He was born in a manger with no fanfare. He was massively misunderstood, mistreated, dishonored, and mocked, and finally crucified by the ones that he had come to save. He never responded in a carnal manner to the mistreatment and dishonor he received from us. He hangs on the cross, and his final statement is, Father, forgive them. This inspires my worship. Because when I, let me just say this, when I feel dishonored and mistreated by people, I sometimes have a surge of a carnal response there. And can anyone, anyone raise their hand there? And, and, and when the Holy Spirit point, points out my carnal response, sometimes, all I can do is go back and marvel at, at Jesus' refusal to have a carnal response because his mistreatment and dishonor is so massively greater than anything you and I have experienced. And he had no carnal response. And so many times when I am aware of my own carnal response to being dishonored by people, it drives me to worship Jesus because scripture says, you become like who you worship.
And there was no loss of dignity when the king became a servant. Like I said, his willingness to serve only increases his dignity. I just want to read a couple bullet point statements. Jesus shows us that true greatness is found when we use favor from God to become servants of men. Can I say that again? True greatness is found when we use favor from God to become servants of men. Jesus was willing to expose himself to rejection so that he could give us acceptance. He was willing to absorb wrath so he could demonstrate God's love. He was willing to take on man's sin so he could give us God's righteousness. He was willing to temporarily lose relationship with his father so he could restore our relationship with the father. He was willing to expose himself to our shame so that he could restore our dignity. So I'm back to Philippians chapter two, reading from verse eight. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God and us have highly exalted him and we give him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee must bow those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What did, the, what did John the Baptist say when he first saw Jesus? What does he say? Behold. What does he say? Do you remember? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the fulfillment of every sacrificial lamb that was ever sacrificed in the Old Testament. Remember, they had to be spotless lambs. Every sacrifice of a lamb in the Old Testament was a prophetic picture pointing forward to the perfect lamb of God, the sinless lamb of God, Jesus, that was sacrificed for the sin of mankind. John the Baptist correctly identifies him and says, behold, This is the lamb. Lamb meaning the one who won't defend himself when he is in the process of being crucified. This is the lamb because a lamb is defenseless, right? This is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he is now, like I said, the lamb upon the throne. That is, he inspires all worship in heaven and on earth. Some of my favorite worship songs are based on Revelation chapter five, four and five. Worthy is the lamb. There's no one like you. Jesus has no rivals in his glory. No one even close. Worthy is the lamb to receive power and honor and glory and riches. For he redeemed us unto God by his own blood out of every tribe, kindred, and nation, and he made us to be kings and priests unto our God. I just read this again, verse nine. Therefore God also highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. So this king who humbled himself to the point of being crucified by mankind is now become the object of man's adoration. We dishonored him and placed upon his head the crown of thorns. But now we are inspired to honor him with a royal crown that he deserves. Humankind gave him a crown that he didn't deserve and now we're inspired to give him a crown that he does deserve. And what is, that, what is happening in heaven? The mind-blown elders are prostrating themselves before the throne and casting their crowns before the king. In the gesture of casting your crown, what you're doing is returning honor to honor's source. Because God took away man's shame and gave us God's dignity. 
And so when the elders are casting their crowns, it is a gesture recognizing that the honor God gave man was not deserved and they're returning honor to its source. Because there is only one that deserves honor. And when he, when, when, when he takes the spotlight and he comes on the scene in heaven, every human crown comes off and honor returns to its source. <laughs> uh. He was once the object of our hatred. He has now become the object of our affection. So we cast our crowns before his throne. <laughs> Let's talk about greatness in serving. So turn to Matthew chapter 20, starting with verse 20. You may be familiar with this passage. So this is Matthew 20, 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from Jesus. And Jesus said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that my two sons may sit at your right hand and on the left in your kingdom. So this mother is asking that her sons will have the highest position in heaven. And let me just say this. She is incorrectly assuming that a person's greatness is determined by their position. Now, I'm interested in Jesus' response. He does not rebuke her for her desire for her son's greatness. Why? Because the desire for greatness is a godly desire that God has put in every human. And I'd say that again. Because God is a hero himself, he has put in every human heart the desire to make an impact on the earth, and he has given you a desire for greatness. And I'm telling you, that's not prideful. But let me say this, instead of rebuking her for desiring her son's greatness, what he goes on to do is compassionately instruct her on what greatness is in the kingdom. So Jesus answered and said, verse 22, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with a baptism that I'm going to be baptized with. And they said to him, we are able. <laughs> so he said to them, you will ind indeed drink my cup. What is he prophesying? Every, every, every disciple was eventually martyred. And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give for it is for those to whom it is prepared by my father. And when, he, and when they heard of it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. And Jesus called them to himself and said, so here's the instruction. Again, he's not rebuking them for desiring greatness. He is now going to lay out what greatness in the kingdom is so that they can experience greatness because God put it in their heart for greatness. I said before that they incorrectly assume that greatness is determined by their position. Well, let's see what Jesus says to them. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just Now here, here's the thing. We already said that you have part of your identity in Christ's humility, amen? So look at what Jesus says about himself right here, verse 28. Just as the man, son of man, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You know, in the world, 
Jesus is saying the Gentiles lord it over them. What he's saying is that in the, what do you call it? In the organizational chart in the world, the CEO and the ones on top are, are the ones that are, are considered the most valuable and maybe they are just bossing everybody else around. That's what he's saying, right? Are you, are you with me? But Jesus is saying, um, um, he's turning the organizational chart upside down is what he's doing. Instead of the pyramid where the greatest people on top, he has reversed the pyramid with the greatest on the bottom, the greatest becoming the servants. And you can see this in scripture um, because remember it says apostles and prophets are a foundation, right? right? That means they're on the bottom of the pyramid, folks. And so, and so leaders are called to lay their life down to see those that they're caring for reach their full potential. And so to become a leader in the kingdom is a step down, a step down to serve, to lift people up to their full potential. That's what Jesus is saying. And he's saying that defines greatness. See, this is a little bit different message than what I've been talking about for the first three weeks. But let me just say this. If you don't receive the revelation that you are the son of the father's joy, then when God calls you to be a servant, you, you will be doing it to perform for the father's love. Does that make sense? God does not want robotic, duty-driven Christians with some motive to perform to serve the world to get God to love them. Are you with me? He wants you steeped in the understanding that you're loved by God if you do nothing. And then, when you're steeped in that understanding, he wants you to partner with him to take off the royal robe off your shoulder and join him to wrap it around his waist. So you get to join him in being the object of the father's joy and you get to join him in being the humble, loving servant of the world. And both of those dimensions are dimensions of intimacy with God. I used to think that when I worship God, that was the intimate time. That was the time where I'm getting my battery recharged. And there's some truth to that. But then I thought, when I'm out trying to love people, then I'm depleting my battery. Does that make sense? And, and then the Lord changed that idea. He said, he said, when you're worshiping me, that is one dimension of intimacy, but when you're partnering with me to display my love to broken and hurting people, you don't lose intimacy with me. It's every much as intimate either way. You're in partnership with me, whether you're being loved by God or whether you're using that love to love undeserved people. God doesn't leave you. He doesn't leave you to your own devices to try to love people. He wants you to immerse yourself in his love so much that you can't help yourself but to love people. That's why David said, my cup runs over. If you're full to the brim with God's love, you can't help getting somebody wet, even if it's by accident. So I'm just saying, you, could, you can just major on the love of God and bumble around and you're just going to love somebody by accident, even if you're not trying. <laughs> oh. Let me talk for a minute about Mary and Martha. Yeah, raise your hand if you're kind of aware of that contrast, okay? Okay. <laughs> How many are aware of certain people that you know that are more like Mary and more like Martha in the kingdom? Okay, so 
I'm just going to come right out and say right now, I'm more like Mary. I'm more like Mary. I am the emphasis of my life is, is to worship and receive God's love. And, and most of the effective evangelism that I've done is just God filters it through my prophetic gift. And I've been so immersed in God's love that I keep bumping into people and surprising them by God's love. And, and I'm not doing a lot of fasting and praying that I'll be able to change the world. I mean, I'm just like, I'm just making a different with, difference everywhere without even trying. When I say everywhere, most of that activity is in kitchens. Somehow God has made, I was a health inspector for 21 years. And so a health inspector has authority to close a restaurant down, right? They have, they have authority that comes from the government. And somehow God saw it, it took pleasure to give me spiritual authority in the same place where I had natural authority. So, so I had authority from San Diego County government to inspect restaurants, but God saw fit to give me authority from heaven to change the atmosphere in restaurants. And we're gonna, we're, I'm gonna give you one testimony today about that, but back to Mary and Martha. So, you know that Martha is wanting to serve people. And I think both of the activities of Mary and Martha are legitimate in the kingdom. Because God boils down the Ten Commandments into two. And what are those? To love, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. Martha is focused on loving her neighbor. Mary is focused on loving God. And I think that we all need to, need to try to be balanced in loving God and loving people. But some of us are not completely balanced. I am somewhat imbalanced myself, but I need to be, my wife is saying amen, because she is more of a Martha and I'm more of a Mary. And we've had to learn to honor each other in our marriage. She's always thinking about tasks she can do to serve people. And I mean, to me, that, that, that's somehow just annoying. I just want to get into God's presence. I want to sense his heart and then I want to communicate his heart either through prophecy or prayer, but I don't really care that much about serving people until, but then God actually ambushes me with his love for people when I love God. So um, <laughs> I believe that Mary and Martha in the kingdom, now just say this, raise your hand if you see a new grace among churches in this region and among leaders for unity. Yeah. So the atmosphere has changed here, but one of the things that God is doing right now, I'm going to speak prophetically. He is, he is causing people that are, are, are on the Mary side and people that are on the Martha side, he is causing us to fall in love with one another. You might say it this way the worship community and the evangelistic community are being married together. And this is epic. This is epic because I've never seen this happen before in 30 years of being in San Diego. What I've seen is that people that were prone to loving people in the church, the evangelistic types, they wanted to do street ministry and they were greatly annoyed by Christians spending all their time in churches. And so, and so in their annoyance, they just pretty much decided, I'm not, I'm not being part of a church anymore. I'm just going to do street ministry. And so, and so they were kind of disgusted with the church. And then, and then you had those that were more prone to worship and to being, doing the Mary stuff. And they, they misunderstood those that were prone to, to evangelism. And the two groups just couldn't get together. You had a divided worship community and, 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 and people that were incapable of honoring one another, that is changing. And we need each other. 
because I need to be around people they see, my, I know that my gift is to equip people to fulfill the first commandment. The first commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. I know that's my emphasis. But I need to be surrounded by people that are also helping to equip the body of Christ to love people. I do. And I need to honor them. I don't need to think that you hear me say stuff up here like your only task is to bask. I just want you to be a walrus that rolls up on the beach and suns yourself in the love of God. I really mean that because I, I, don't, I, I want Christians to be motivated to love people because they're being loved by God. I don't want them to be duty-driven and robotic in their Christianity trying to do stuff to please God. I want them to be inspired by the extravagant, undeserved love of God and have that spill out to those around them. I don't even think that you are supposed to love people with your own love. I think God's got more love for you than you can contain. And so so you don't have to contain it. You can give it away but you're giving away his love, not your own. You're not gritting your teeth and trying to love people. Is this making sense? So I'm just saying, if you don't get the first commandment right, what is the point to try to put pressure on people to fulfill the second commandment? Are you with me? I want the whole church to be balanced in both commandments. And I'm saying I need other brethren that can help to equip people in loving people. And so how does the body of Christ unlock treasure in each other when we recognize that some of us are Marys and some of us are Marthas? How do we unlock treasure in one another? We recognize the gift in in one another. Yeah, we we realize that we need each other because we're not completely balanced in our own perspective. And so what we, we choose to honor someone that is different than us because we need them. And when we honor them, get this, and I'm going to borrow from a sermon I heard at my church from Rita Sue Frazier, on Sunday. Remember when Jesus says, he says, a prophet has no honor in his own country. If you look at the New Living Translation, that says, a prophet has no honor when he's with his family, when he's with his relatives. And then it said, Jesus could do no miracles where he had no honor. And so, when I honor somebody that is better at equipping the church to love people, when I choose to honor them, what I'm doing is I'm changing the atmosphere in this region so that miracles are able to happen. That's how important that is. Because if Jesus couldn't do miracles when there was dishonor, how much more are we not going to be able to as the body of Christ? So as we discover the differences in each other and that we need each other, there needs to be an upswell of a servant heart towards one another, massively honoring people that bring different gifts to the table than us. Then we will set up an atmosphere where miracles are commonplace. But when you honor someone, you know the scripture, honor a prophet in the name of a prophet and receive a reward. When you honor someone, you are unlocking a reward in them. So it means you're unlocking the treasure of Christ in someone when you honor them. And so I want to do that right now. I believe that there is the beginnings of a marriage between the worship community and those that are loving people community. Can I say that? And I want to mention some names. We have a key person here, Jamie West, and then I'm going to invite up in a second. But can I just honor some people? 
Raise your hand if you know who John and Sandy Clowder are. Okay, almost everybody. I'm telling you that they came to Encinitas to do, and, and John had this idea from God to do drum circles on the beach. They did that for about a decade and they began to love people, especially the new age people. They began to love people in an unconditional way. And I believe that they, they laid some groundwork prophetically for the marriage of the worship community and the evangelistic community. Why? Because the drums are worship. But the clotters were focused on reaching people by combining worship and reaching people. And they did it outdoors at the beach. So they were a prophetic prototype. He was, I talked to John some 10 years ago and he said, God sent me to Encinitas. And so he, he, the, he obeys God and lays the foundation by a prophetic prototype of what the church is going to be. Are you with me? God knew that he wanted to marry the worship and the evangelistic community. Let me say this. When God is enthroned upon his praises, we enthrone him upon our, his, uh, our praises, then from the place of his throne, he can do whatever he wants. And so it becomes easier for people to experience the love and the healing that God wants to bring them when we enthrone him on, his, on our praises. And that's how it works. David's tabernacle is another picture of that. In Acts 15, the, the, the word comes that uh, David's tabernacle will be restored in the New Testament. David's tabernacle was a 30-year period where there was constant worship, okay, in the Old Testament. And so the prophecy in Acts 15 says, God says, I will restore David's tabernacle and, and, and in that prophetic word, the combination of worship and effective evangelism becomes a prototype for the New Testament church. Because the, the prophecy is given, I will restore David's tabernacle so that the remnant of the Gentiles might come in. So in the context, in the historical context of that, the Gentiles were the ones outside of God's covenant. And so what God is saying is, is, when worship is sustained and when God's presence is enthroned, it becomes easier for people to experience God. And the people that don't know God are, are ushered into an atmosphere where God on the throne can do whatever he wants to do. And that's how we cooperate together between the worship community and the evangelistic community. Last week when I was going on my hike, I had the Lord use this word um, when I was hiking and he said this to me and I, di I didn't in know what it meant because I couldn't remember the symbolism. Raise your hand if you remember there are 12 tribes of Jacob, 12 tribes of Jacob. Jacob. They, each, they each had different names, right? So we know the tribe of Judah means what? What does Judah mean? Praise. So I bet you don't know what the tribe of Zebulon symbolizes. <laughs> so each tribe uh, in the Old Testament has a spiritual significance. And the tribe of Zebulon represents evangelism. And so I heard the Lord say to me when I was hiking last week, I am marrying Judah and Zebulon in this region. I heard him say that, and I had to go back to Scripture because I, I couldn't remember what Zebulon symbolized. So do you, do you hear the honor that I have in my heart for John and Sandy Clowder? Yes. They pioneered something in this region, and they were prophetic prototypes of what God wanted to expand in this region. Another prototype person is, is uh, Henry Haney. Henry Haney steps out into the unknown and God says to him a few years back, I want you to build a community of worshipers that is bigger than local church. What a novel idea. No one had done it before. And so he starts doing the ones and then that style of David's tabernacle sustained worship begins moving around the whole county. 
So now every city in the county is being touched by sustained worship. It begins to change the atmosphere in this county. And now leaders like me and Mike Hubbard and Larry and different leaders, we are now discovering that we love one another and we want to cooperate together in the kingdom. And there's a new grace for unity because before leaders were so compartmentalized trying to build their own churches. And in some cases, pastors were territorial and competitive. And also, some pastors were offended at other pastors because they'd stepped on their toes in ministry. I'm saying God has changed the atmosphere. And I think it took Henry Haney to step into God's will to do that. Now there's a whole new grace for unity. Isn't this good? God has a plan. All right, so Jamie, can I call you up here? <laughs> you may ha have some things to say, but I want to do this. Um, Clyde, can you hold the mic again? So just face the people. Yeah. <laughs> so Jamie, um, in the name of Jesus... I honor you, whoops, wrong way. <laughs> I honor you as the son of the father's delight. Mm. I honor you as a man to whom God has removed your shame and given him all his dignity. I thank you for the authority, God, that you've given Jamie. And we bless his feet because, Lord, one of the strengths of this man is his ability to be on the move and display your love for, for people that haven't experienced it. And God, so I just want to thank you that you have shod his feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And Lord, by this prophetic action to Jamie Weston, Jamie, I want to say that I value you more than I can even put into words, that I need you in the kingdom that I recognize that you and others that are called to love people and equip the saints to love people. I want to say, Jamie, I need you. Yes. I want to work with you and others to help equip people to fulfill both commandments, to love God with all their heart, mind, and soul, and to love others as themselves. And Jamie, I bless you. I'm going to remove this. Jamie, I thank you that you, are, that you have taken up the robe of humility, that you have made the decision, you know that you're a son of the Father's delight and that you bear his dignity, but you wear the apron well, Jamie. You've chosen to love people and become a servant of people, even if you have to leave your comfort zone. And so God... Will you look upon my honor of him and people like John Clowder and Sandy and people like uh, Desiree and Eric, God, and, and people like Jim Hedricks. God, there are people in the kingdom that are greatly motivated to love people. And so, God, I just say, let there be a marriage between the worship community and the community of people that is motivated to love people. Jamie, I bless your ministry. I bless the expansion of your ministry. I bless you to raise up disciples that, that, that are simply um, moving in spiritual gifts and using, uh, taking on the identity of Christ as a servant healer of mankind. I bless you to grow in gifts of healing and to give it away to the body of Christ. God, would you set up an atmosphere here where, where the worship community honors those that, that are loving people to such a way as that miracles would become more commonplace yes. in the body of Christ. Mm. We choose to honor one another so that miracles are easier to see happen. Yes. God. Yes. 
Thank you, Jesus. You know, another thing that blesses me, and I don't see Henry Haney here, but one of the things that would symbolize the marriage of the worship community and the outreach community is the tremendous friendship that occurs between Jamie and Henry. If I guess for people that are on Facebook, you see them posting a lot of different food that they eat in restaurants. And there, there, there is a friendship developed <laughs> around, <laughs> around their, their, desire, their desire for good food. But I am grateful that a man who is like Henry with such an anointing for worship is, is become such a fast friend with a guy that is, is wanting to equip the saints to love people. It's, it is a, uh, there you are. Henry, come up here. Let's clap for Henry. Henry, will you? I want you to give each other a... <laughs> <laughs> so this is a new thing. Just, just keep hugging for a second. I want to bless you. <laughs> keep hugging. God, God, this is a new thing. That, Father, that there would be um, a blending together of the gifts of the worship community and the outreach community. And we love it. And these guys, they're, they're not just partnered together because they recognize that they could function together. This is a relationship based on delight, not just function. And Father, in, in the body of Christ in the past, we have tried to do things and created projects just around function when you wanted to organically join people around friendship. And so, God, we call forth the divine joining in the body of Christ, God, in this region where, where you are organically linking people because you're joining them as friends. And, God, we say yes to that we'd fall in love with one another. And in doing so, let the honor that permeates this county begin to move in this region in a way where it is so much easier for people to experience the love of Christ. Father, you said, if you be lifted up, you will draw all men unto you. So we want the maximum lifting up of you in worship. And we want the maximum drawing all men unto you, which corresponds with you being lifted up. God, I also thank you for Kara Rial. God, I thank you for, um, what is there, uh, Dave and Ann Clark. Let, think about that prototype. I don't know if you know who they are, but anyway, God, we just lift up people that have been out of the box in their ability to do outreach, and we just bless what you want to do. I feel the Lord saying, I'm just going to prophesy, you guys can sit down. I say, the Lord says that nothing, you haven't seen anything yet in this county. As you, as, as you move by the promptings of my Holy Spirit and you fall in love with one another that are different from you, says the Lord, you are going to watch my government permeate this region in a way that you never thought was even possible. And it will happen when I divinely join people that are different from one another and the Lord says, even as opposites attract in marriage, so I am bringing people together that could never come together except they had the grace of God. And in the kingdom, two gifts that are opposite are now going to be attracted to each other. And I'm going to pour out grace for people to honor one another like never before. And so, Lord, we say, so be it. Thank you, God. Here's an, let me just honor another person too. Neil Frazier. Okay. And we talked about, we talked about John Clauder who came in to, uh, with a drum circle and combined worship with, with outreach. But Neil would walk on the beach for say two hours from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. and speak in tongues. 
He's done that for decades in Encinitas on Moonlight Beach. What was he doing? What was his physical? He was walking. See what I mean? Do you see the prophetic picture? He was walking while he was worshiping. Yeah, his feet were shod. He was doing a prophetic action and he was laying a foundation spiritually. And Neil, you didn't even know what you're doing. You're just, you're just speak, speaking in tongues and God is using that heavenly language to actually change the atmosphere here. So isn't this exciting that we can celebrate something that God is up to? He is doing this. So you never quite know what's going to happen with me. <laughs> Let's pray for a minute, and then we're going to take our 15-minute break. Father, we just thank you that you've got a plan that's better than anything we could devise. And we thank you, Lord, that we can go whole hog in our merry identity. We can worship you in an extravagant way. We want to bust the ceiling here off worship. <laughs> God, we want, we, we want you to lead us into an intensity of worship in this county that is beyond human ability. Will you take us to places in worship that we can't get to in human ability? We ask God that, it, that, the, that the intensity of worship here in this county will be will, that we literally be able to bring the intensity of heaven's worship to earth here. And you will be so massively enthroned upon your praises that from that place of your throne, you'll be, you are then able to do whatever the king wants to do. We'd, we would rather worship you and release your ability to rule than try to rule ourselves. God, because we just... We don't have enough strategy or energy to rule in a way where the church can be effective at reaching our community. And so, Lord, where we've fallen short as a church in the quest to reach our communities, we are asking, Father, that as we enthrone you, you would literally change the atmosphere here and make it easy for people to discover you make it easier for them to experience miracles. You'd make it easy for the easier them to experience healing. And God, we will follow Henry Haney's and Jamie's example of taking delight to communities merging for the good of the kingdom of God. Father, and I thank you that it's a better way to live. <laughs> We, we may not all be posting food on, on Facebook, but God, we pledge to come together to honor and to love one another and see your kingdom come here in a way that has never been seen before. We rise up, every Mary rises up and honors the Marthas and vice versa because we need each other, God. Amen. All right, so we're gonna, I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, talking about how prophecy, the gift of prophecy, helps determine identity. Let me say that again. The gift of prophecy helps determine identity. So I just want to make this statement, and, we're, and after about 15 minutes, I'm turning it over to, to Mike Hubbard to give his testimony. God uses prophecy to help you see your true identity from his point of view. Now, think about Gideon in Scripture. How is Gideon seeing himself compared to how God sees him? Yeah. He's an abs he sees himself as completely insignificant, a wimp. In fact, the most insignificant one in his whole family. And he sees no evidence of God um, even in his, 
in his circumstance, no evidence. And so God breaks in and the angel gives him a prophetic word. It is a statement of his true identity from God's perspective. You are a mighty man of valor. Now he waffles quite a bit with that. He has to do fleeces and all kinds of things. He is, he is one of the least, um, he's not very quick to begin to embrace his own identity. I think, I think maybe he does like five or six things to try to reconfirm that this is really God. You, you know that story, right? But true humility is agreeing with what God says about you. Some people think humility is thinking less of yourself. But for Gideon and for you, true humility is agreeing with what God says about you. And I believe that God sees treasure in you and greatness in you that you don't even see in yourself. So we need to give up the false humility of thinking less of ourselves and let God define our greatness because inside of each of you is a treasure in an earthen vessel. And God is in the process of unearthing that treasure so it can be put on display for all people. How many of you are blessed by prophetic words? Yeah, an accurate prophetic word brings God's perspective of how he really sees you. The other thing about prophecy determined identity is, you remember what Jacob does in Genesis 49? Does that ring a bell? Jacob is the father of 12 tribes. And in Genesis 49, Jacob is a father that's giving prophetic words to all of his 12 sons. So I believe that fathers in the kingdom of God, and we can include mothers, are, they, they have the responsibility to call forth identity in the next generation. They have the responsibility to bless their kids and spiritual kids and to get a hold of God's view of their natural and spiritual kids and say it out loud. Even if they're not currently displaying their identity that you're seeing, you're responsible as a parent or spiritual parent to get a hold of how God sees your children and then, be, and then begin to say it, begin to pray it. It's called speaking things that be not as though they are. You know that scripture? So I want to give, I want to uh, tell you a testimony of what happened to me. I was up in... Riverside a few years ago, I was in a Quiznos, and inside the Quiznos, there was a manager, um, and I want to describe him to you. Um, he was as big as me, he had tattoos on every part of his body, and he had a long ponytail, and he was an intimidating guy that seemed to have, he was fairly young, he looked like he was about 25. This was in a college town in the city of Riverside. So I'm in there inspecting the kitchen. And I walk in, and uh, you, you get the description of this guy? So he's got a bit of an attitude towards authority. So he has a little bit of an attitude towards me as well, because I'm in there inspecting the kitchen. And the Lord keeps speaking to me while I'm doing this evaluation in saying, I want, you to, I want you to tell this man that his heart is full of kindness and that he has a shepherd's heart. God was actually showing me his true identity. He said, he's, God says, this man is so generous that he will give the shirt off his back to the people around him. And he's, he, he has the heart of a shepherd. He has natural leadership ability. He's loyal and gathers people around him. And the Lord says, I want you to tell him that. 
And so I'm pretty experienced in the prophetic gift, but I kept asking the Lord, are you sure? Because <laughs> he doesn't, doesn't, I don't know. I don't know about this. So it turns out that the, I'm there early and nobody is, no customer has, is in the kitchen yet. So I'm looking for an opportunity to somehow start this conversation with him. And so um, I just, the Holy Spirit gives me the green light. And I say, do you know, I, I do this for a living. I inspect restaurants. I do it part time. But I said, I'm a pastor. Do you know what that is? He nods his head. I said, well, sometimes when I'm in restaurants, God will show me people's hearts so that I can encourage them. And I said, that's what's happening to me right now for you. Would you like to hear it? I've never had anybody say no to that. Um, they might think I'm a kook, but they still want to hear it. So, <laughs> so I begin to say what God had told me. And I begin to describe in detail the way God is actually, he sees every aspect of the treasure that's inside this man. And you could not see by looking at him, but God was reading his heart. And so he listens to me and I'm having trouble figuring out, you know, whether he wants, whether, how, what his response is, is he going to punch me? He's just like taking it all in. I don't know if it's a negative or positive response. And so I ask him, what do you think about that? I mean, I've just ambushed him with the love of God and with, with, and with heaven's statement of his identity. And he's stunned. I said, what, what do you think about that? And he says, right now, I'm just blown away. I don't even know what to say. So then, and then I said, well, tell me a little bit more. He said, everything you said was true. He said, I, I don't know how you do this. So I say, this is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And the reason that, that I'm here right now is that God loves you so much that he would cause our paths to meet because he wants a relationship with you. So I say that, and I would have gone somewhat further, but customers began to come in. So I sat down in the dining room, and he's the only one helping the customers. And so God says, write out the gospel message. So I took my EcoSure paper, that's the company I work for. It had, it had the letterhead for the company I work for because it was the paper I had. And I write out a three-page document where what I do is record the, the, the entire prophetic word that this guy has just confirmed is true. So I write out the whole prophetic word. And then I say to him, the Lord says, write out the gospel message for him. And, and when I am expressing the gospel, it is good news. And so the, what, what, what I say is I say to the people, when I have a prophetic divine appointment with them, I say, the reason that this happened is because God wants to get your attention. He wants a relationship with you. And he doesn't want to just have some miracle like this happen every third year. He wants to have an ongoing intimate relationship with you. And then I say, and he has done everything in his power to make that possible. He's just waiting for you to say yes. That is my non-religious way to say the gospel. Because it is true. The Lord has already made the decision to redeem humans. They just have to say yes to it. And so I write out the whole gospel, and I even write out the prayer to receive Christ. Uh, it's a three-page document. When I'm sitting in the dining room, this has never happened to me before or since. But I feel the Spirit of God come down on me and actually heat me up like an oven. It's, 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 it, the, the fire of God actually comes on me and I'm trembling as I'm writing this. So I give this document to him and I just know that I'm absolutely in the center of God's will. And it is so exhilarating to have God use you this way. 
But let me tell you, every time that I've had a prophetic word, and this has happened hundreds of times for me in restaurants, sometimes I actually have to go through a translator because I'm speaking to a Hispanic person and, I, and they don't understand English. So it's like God has put me on a missions trip right in the United States. Uh, I got to tell you another story. Uh, do I have your attention? I got to tell you one more story, okay? So this was a while ago. You know where uh, Mission Valley is, right? So I'm at a little a Mexican restaurant in Mission Valley. It's about 3 p.m. I walk in, I go into the kitchen, and there's Christian Hispanic music playing, and I can't understand the words, but I can feel the spirit of it. So the spirit is just permeating the place. And there's very few customers in at 3 p.m. So there's workers in there. They're all Hispanic. It's one family. It's like a little family mom-and-pop operation. There's a lady about 65 in the kitchen preparing food. God says to me, you need to honor this lady because she's a spiritual matriarch of this whole family. And, and, and she is so humble, and she's constantly praying for all these other family members and the Lord says, I'm hearing her prayer, and I want you to publicly honor her in the middle of the whole family. So <laughs> this was funny. This is a funny one. So I go, there's nobody that is, can translate. There's nobody that can translate. In it. And so I have to walk out into the dining room. I walk out into the dining room and say, I'm a health inspector. I, I, and then I said, um, I have a prophetic word for somebody in the kitchen. The guy understands what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, and I said, I, are you bilingual? Can you translate for me? And he goes, yes. I said, would you want to help me? He goes, yes, I know what prophecy is. I want to help. <laughs> <laughs> so we go back in the kitchen. And, and, and so this really gets people's attention. So he walks back in the kitchen. He explains what I'm about to do. And so the whole Hispanic family gathers around this lady. All the food production stops in the kitchen. And so there's probably about eight people gathered around this spiritual matriarch lady. I begin to pray for her, and the Spirit of God falls in that restaurant because, because they all start crying. They recognize that this is God. They all know who she is. They all know that, they, that, that she prays for her. They know that this is accurate. And so they're marveling and they're asking now for words. Will you give me a word? Will you give me a word? And it turns out they're calling people. There's people going out to the telephone saying, there's a man of God in this kitchen that is telling us stuff about ourselves that, that from God. What, will you come to this restaurant? So nobody comes in the front door for an hour. Not a single customer from three o'clock to four o'clock. God actually turns that restaurant into a church meeting for a whole hour. But, but, but let me tell you that the icing on the cake, the man that was doing the translating for me, I mean, as I begin to prophesy over everyone in that restaurant, the guy that's doing the translation, it turns out that he's a contractor. And somehow by the Spirit of God, I just know that. He, he doesn't tell me. So I get finished prophesying over each one, and I say, you're a contractor, aren't you? And he said, yes. And then I said, and the Spirit of God showed me to tell him, God says, I want to bless you financially, but something is blocking your ability to receive the blessing that I have for you. So I say that to him, and this is what he comes back to say to me. He says, about 10 years ago, as a contractor, I was attending a church full-time. He said, the pastor asked me to build a new church building for him. And the pastor was my friend. So I built the, the church building for him, and he never paid me. And so he said, I was so offended by that that I have not been to church since. But he said, what keeps happening to me because because." I'm not able to forgive him as I keep encountering people in my contracting business that rip me off. And so over and over again, I am getting mistreated and financially ripped off. Now, now get this. The very first thing that the Lord said to him, 
Think about the compassion in this prophetic word. He says, God says, I want to bless you financially, but there's something in your heart blocking it. See, God was intent to remove that which prevented this man's blessing. He wasn't wanting to rebuke the man for his unforgiveness. He was wanting to give this man a supernatural ability to forgive so he could unlock blessing to him. And so the man right there in the restaurant, because of the power of the prophetic word, the man says to me, will, will you pray with me as I forgive this pastor and everyone else in my life that has ripped me off financially? So we sit there, we, we stand there, and, and he prays and repents and confesses the, the unforgiveness that he has for all that financial um, mistreatment. And then the Holy Spirit says, you pronounce over him financial blessing because now everything has been removed that prevents the blessing from coming. And so I was able to call forth in the Spirit of God financial blessing over this man. And I'll tell you, when I walked out into the parking lot, it was like my feet were six inches off the ground. I was floating. And, and I've seen dozens, maybe hundreds of things like that happen in restaurants for me. But here's the deal about prophecy calling forth identity. I found in each one of these divine encounters that God, there's three things that God wants to communicate to people in the prophetic word, three things. The first is God wants to say to them, I know you. He doesn't want people to feel anonymous or unimportant. So, so the word of knowledge is specific so that they will realize God knows me. There is a tremendous desire in every human heart to be known. And when they find out that God knows who they are, they're not just a number on the planet. Even if they're a Christian, they're not just part of this throng of humanity that's redeemed, but God knows them personally. So God will come in and he will move through you in your prophetic gift. And what he's wanting to express to people is, I know you, I see you, and I know you. The second thing that he's wanting to communicate is, you are valuable. I see you, I know you, you're valuable. The last thing that he wants to communicate is your life has purpose, okay? I see you, I know you, you're valuable, your life has purpose. See, and all of that, God himself is intent to call forth identity in people. He is... He is, in, in fact, when you use your prophetic gift out in the world, you are like a human metal detector. Yeah. You are, you are finding hidden treasure in earthen vessels that is buried by their humanity. When Adam was created, how did God form him? Out of dirt. There is treasure hidden in earthen vessels. And the prophetic gift and the word of knowledge is able to look beyond the dirt, beyond the humanness, and look inside of their hearts and find hidden treasure in earthen vessels, and then use your voice to call it out. And when your voice calls out hidden treasure in earthen vessels, it now brings the treasure to the surface so that it can be enjoyed by people. And so we'll just read this scripture, 2 Corinthians 4. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined into your hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Um, if you can see a person the way that God sees them, and you speak that forth, your words are creative. 
Your prophetic words are not just mere flattery or trying to make people feel good. If you are getting hold of how God sees someone and then you speak what God is saying, your words are creative in the same way that God's word was creative in Genesis. God said, let there be light, and he was able to create something out of nothing by his own words. I'm telling you that if you can hear what God is saying about people and you can see the treasure in an earthen vessel and you speak it out with your words, you actually give them power to become what God wants them to be. You become a co-creator with God by the use of God's words. That's how powerful the prophetic gift is. And he can see their true identity. And I'm telling you, their hearts resonate like, like a mean looking guy with tattoo, tattoos all over his body and a ponytail fully melts in the hand of God when God speaks his true identity. He told me everything you said is true. He said, I'm in a band and they all think that I'm like a pastor. They tell me, they tell me that I care for people in this band and that I, I, I will do anything for them. And then he says, I have a best friend who keeps telling me about Christ, but, but I haven't responded. And I said, well, I want you to go tell him what just happened today. <laughs> because I think he's praying for you. Uh, l- let's read this scripture in 1 Corinthians 4. We read 6 and 7, but it says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Oh, Romans 4, 17 says, God who quickened us from the dead calls things that be not as though they are. Yeah, so you've got the power to help people become what God has always dreamed for them by the use of your words. Colossians 4, 6 says, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. The word grace in the scripture means Um, it means the enabling power of God. So the scripture says, let your words be with grace to others. What it's saying is, let your words carry with it the power of God to enable people to become what God wants them to be. Prophecy is the ability to build a life with your words. Grace is the enabling power of God to help, help us become what God has called us to be. God uses your words to give another person power to become what God is calling them to be. Power to become. Is that anywhere else in Scripture, that phrase, power to become? As many as received him, John says, God gave to them the power to become the sons of God. (sighs) Isn't that exciting? So as you discover your identity in this class, God will empower you. And there's another class right before this one, a prophetic class. God is wanting to empower people to discover their identity and then be agents through which God calls forth other people's identity. Amen. So now I want Mike Hubbard to come up and he's going to give a testimony of um, some things in his life and how he compiled some prophetic words in his life to, to, to put together an identity statement. Mike, come on up now. Let me just say first that um, one of the reasons I'm really excited about our city is this guy here. (laughs) Just want to honor him a second. Yeah? That guy there, too, is another reason, by the way. There's a lot of reasons. To watch, and I've I've been lived in San Diego all my life, been a Christian for 40 years this year, been in ministry almost as long, and never, ever, ever seen San Diego begin to shift like it is in these past few years. And, and many of you are the reasons why. It's happening, guys. 
We want to ride that wave, right? And, and you guys are part of that wave. One of the things we, we need to step into, is we're, we're in a transition time. I don't want to say too much. I just got to bounce off what Bill did because I think it's important. We are transitioning, each of us. How many feel like you're, just, you're in a big cha change transition? Just things are shifting for you. And if, if you're like me, you're probably pretty clueless what it's going to look like. Graham Cook has this great saying. It says, if you're disillusioned, that's good because you won't have any illusions about yourself. <laughs> Disillusionment is the first step to getting rid of some illusions. My first encounter with a big illusion was 19 years old. And uh, I was a pretty good athlete, not the best, but better than most. And I had an illusion of being an uh, NFL quarterback. And I was, I was pretty good. I mean, I had some offers for college, and I broke an ankle, and I started taking drugs. And suddenly, you know, if, if you're not focused, you're not going to make it very far. And I wasn't focused. So I, I, hit a, I, I was disillusioned in my illusion of doing something. And that, it's not bad to have a dream like that. But it wasn't what God had for me. It was my own illusion. So what God begins to do with us, he breaks off the illusions we are living in. I think our old man, the old nature, the things, the regrets, the, the, the sinful flesh life that we've all grown up with, that's an illusion. Reality is that Christ has called you to be this new thing. So if you get a delusion, that might be a good thing. That, hey, what's God breaking off of me? That might mean something good's coming. That might mean there's a reality that's coming to you, a spiritual reality that you can say, okay. So if you're a little confused right now, that's totally cool. Lord, where's the clarity? Because I know there's some clarity coming. Right now, my wife and I are in a, in a really unique spot with our housing situation. We just suddenly got shifted out of a house we were at. We got offered some money because it was... It got auctioned off. It wasn't our house we were renting. Changed like that. He offered to, made me an offer I couldn't refuse, so we moved in with my daughter temporarily, and we're kind of going, what's God doing with us? We're, I don't even know where he's beginning to start looking. And Bill prayed for me today. I felt good about that. It was good. But there's a little bit of an illusion, but yet there's this expectancy in me. Okay, God's up to something. See, we need to learn to shift our thinking. When, when challenges come that we don't get discouraged, we go, ah, opportunity opportunity. And the reason I believe that is because through the years, God's given me things to hang on to. And one of them is the prophetic words he's given me. <clears throat> right after that disillusionment about my NFL pro career that didn't transpire, I got saved through that process because my dream was gone and I got desperate, started looking and, hey, God met me. And I, like Larry and I go way back, we came through the same, same church. And uh, I'm so grateful for the foundation of the Word of God. Um, quickly got involved in ministry, and I, I was part of a very dynamic church, and uh, very charismatic. It was, it, it was the Miles McPherson rock of the day, put it that way, okay? That's really what it was. It was just the place to be. The Spirit of God was moving, things were happening, people getting saved, mega church all over. So basically, I took my ambition to be an NFL quarterback and moved it into being a superstar pastor. Honestly. Wasn't all bad. I mean, God was using me. I was doing things. But I had within me this desire to be a mega church pastor. And so after about 25, 30 years of trying that and not being successful, I was a delusioned man. There's that word again. Because God wanted to break the illusion. And here was the main thing. I had my identity in being a megachurch pastor. My success was attached to it. Hey, when you grew up with the Sean Mitchells and the Ray Bentleys and all that whole realm, we'd see them as stars. And that's not a put down on them. We just know they're kind of the stars in Christianity, the big churches. You want to compare yourself. Another thing that we tend to do when we're performance-driven when we're always grading ourselves by how good we are and how much we do, when we grade ourselves by that, we always end up being having a sense of failure. And I battled with that, the regrets. The Lord had to literally take me out of ministry. The church was growing. We lost the building, couldn't find another building. We moved to a Sunday afternoon, the death of a Sunday service. 
And after a while, people just said, Mike, it's just not happening anymore. And I realized it wasn't. We had just sold our house, had some money to kind of lean on, and I figured, what am I going to do with my life now? I still love God. I wasn't too happy with the church anymore. <laughs> I, I didn't want to see a pulpit again. I mean, I just had those feelings. I was just, I was just frustrated. So the Lord put me in a motorcycle shop for five years. I'd never ridden a bike before in my life. The favor of God was on me, and I, I was their best salesman for four and a half, five years. Go figure. I loved being in the atmosphere, because all I heard from start to finish were F-bombs, and it's, it's a motorcycle shop. And I loved it. So many opportunities, like Bill talked about, they just would happen. It was just great. I thought, God used that to charge my life again about people, and just, it's like, but this is, I want to do this. I got tired of the box. And that's, that's, that's not to say church is a box. We can make it a box. I had made it a box. I'm taking, I'm, I'm owning this, okay? It's not about other church. It's about me, what I had done, because of my performance driven. So, long story short, you got to realize there are those times of pastoring. I, I, we'd been to the Toronto Revival. We'd done the, uh, uh, done the whole thing, and I was passionate for, re, for revival. I had, had the privilege to hang around guys like Lou Engel. I mean, you just got to hear Lou, and you kind of go, I got to pray more. <laughs> we got to have revival. You know, it's just, it just, I just had it in me. We, I nailed it, didn't I? I've been around it. Just had to have that. And so to walk away from that, I was a pretty discouraged guy. Until one day, <laughs> until one day, I went to the service. A friend of mine uh, had, had me come do some worship. A guy named Mark Tubbs who's at Harvest International Ministries. a great guy. travels around. Came to San Diego. He says, Mike, I got a word for you. And I went, oh, great. I mean, that's my attitude. It was kind of like, I was just kind of going through the motion. I see you at the bottom of a well just lying there and you're just kind of scratching the dirt looking for that revival. Cause, and I realized it was still in me. I'm still passionate about that. But I was just like, God, I'm over. I'm over it. I'm tired of trying. I'm just, I'm happy selling bikes. I'm happy ministering here. I'm happy. Leave me alone. <laughs> God doesn't like to leave you alone. It's a small little church, 30 people, nothing big happening. And, and Mark Tubbs, I kid him to this day, he just, he's talking, says, there's something going on in this city. This was in 2011, way back before, you know, any of the worship stuff was happening. This little spark started to happen. Something's going on in this city. And I'm going, yeah, I've heard that before. Yeah, yeah. That's how I was. And then he says, we ought to have another meeting. I'm going, okay. So the next night he calls a meeting. And a friend opens up his house. And I had to work the next day. And, and part of me is wishing, I want to deal because I don't want to go to the meeting. I get done early. I go to the meeting. I'm a little late. I sit in the back. And Mark's talking, telling the story about how I feel there's something going on in this city. There's something's got to happen in this city. And in the back I say, let's do it. And I thought, oh, crap. <laughs> That just come out of my mouth. And everybody looks at me. I'm going, oh, I guess we got to do something now. God began to lure me back in. And for a few years, it was a struggle kind of stepping back in. Things started to open up for me. I actually stepped out in full faith to go full time. And during that season, God began to minister to me about identity. Had, you know, I had the privilege of hanging around with Graham, Graham Cook in some of his conferences, and his, his word was starting to get in. You know, if you get around Graham, it's all about identity. I'm so thrilled with, with Bill because he is carrying a similar message. And he is, he is here locally pressing that into our spirits. Guys, as we get this message of who we are in Christ, we're going to explode. I believe the enemy is scared to death if you figure out who you are. What's he going to do? He can't, when you figure out who you are and that God's backing you up, he's lost because all he can do is lie to you. When the lie is done, he is helpless and powerless. Right? All he has is lies. He knows the reality. He can't beat God. And all he can do is deceive you because when you get a hold like Gideon that who you are, you'll be a warrior and a conqueror. And that's exactly who you are. So, about the 20th time, I must have heard Graham say this. I finally got it where he said, take your prophetic words. And he has a funny way of saying, just love them, hug them, 
hold them. And I walked away realizing, you know that scripture in Thessalonians where it says, don't despise prophetic utterances? Familiar with that one? We would probably think, well, that's probably for you know, the cessationist part of the church doesn't believe in prophecy. I think that's true, but I also think we as Christians commit that sin by ignoring our prophetic words. Hello? So when that hit me, I began to keep, you know, I always kept my prophetic words, recordings, everything. And I was familiar with them, but the Lord just said, you got to go back in and get a hold of those words. And so for the, well, since then, four or five years ago, those have been my meditations, my devotions. So much so, I started with Isaiah 41, because that's been a long time prophetic word. I've just, you know, a scripture that I've just felt something about. I started reading it, and I got done one day, and God says, read it again. You know, day after day, he would just say, read it again. You know, you kind of go, really? I'm bored with it now. Read it again. To the point where it just starts coming alive. Three months, four months later, I'm still reading it. But then you begin to realize, wow, that's where God tells Abraham. He reminds us that Abraham's a friend of God. Well, that's a whole week's study of just branching off and thinking about the friend of God. See what I'm saying here? God began to show me dimensions of how he saw me, and it began to change me. I believe it's, I believe it's the biblical um, way of meditation. Let me ask you this. How many of you, sometimes at night, you'll just you get spinning about things in your life, and you, know, you, just, you can't get it out, you can't go to sleep, all you do is think about these things, even bad or good things? How many of you have ever had that experience? Well, good. That means you know how to meditate. <laughs> right? That's what meditation is. Meditation is getting so involved in, in your mind, thinking it through, that it actually begins to affect you, changes your emotions, your thoughts, affects your day. That's meditation. What if we took that and applied that to the Word of God? Are you familiar with two major passages about meditation? Joshua and Psalm 1. Blesses the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the way of sinners, sit in the seat of scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he, day and night, you'll be successful. Joshua, meditate on this word of God. You'll be prosperous and successful. You need to learn. I want to encourage you guys. And we're all different in this. I'm, I'm kind of giving my program, but it's going to be different for you. Find it your way. But the word of God in your life, however that comes about, get it in there. Start with your your Biblical uh, prophetic words. I mean, wouldn't you want to know, if God's given you something, isn't that something you want to grab a hold of? You've got this whole book. It's a great book, but when he says something, when he underlines something for you, that's what you want to go to. So as I did that over and over, and you know, I've got reams of stuff. I don't know if I'm going to write a book with it or what. I don't know. Just, just My computer's just filled with all these just different meditations and thoughts, and out of that comes a richness it's not just knowledge. Now it's revelation and wisdom. That's what you want. Because that's transforming. And it begins to transform your life. So out of that came this. An identity in Christ. Now some of this is basic true for all of us. But you need to go to hold of that. But then you get specific what God's called me to be. And I just wrote this out one day, and I just, I've been tinkering with it and playing with it, and it's just kind of grown into, I try to keep it simple, because I'm a simple guy. I am your son, and you are my father, the almighty God. I'm highly favored, and I'm bountifully blessed. I'm forgiven and free from regrets. I'm filled with your presence. I'm kept by your peace and overflowing with love, joy, and hope. You are my friend. I have total access into your heart, your passions, your divine wisdom through continual fellowship with Holy Spirit. You're shaping me into a loving husband. You've given me a gracious wife. She likes that part. And a, beautiful, and a beautiful wife, too. We are raising awesome children who will do great exploits for God. I'm a leader in the body of Christ, an apostle, anointed by his spirit to teach and equip the saints for the work of the ministry and to see that them brought into maturity. I'm called to do the work of the evangelist, spreading the fragrance of Christ wherever I go. I'm a psalmist, a minstrel, a worshiper and warrior with a passion for his presence. See, we're shifting to some more personal stuff because I've gotten words along those lines. Now, 
me just explain apostle thing. There's a lot of confusion about that. I'm not, I don't wear a label, says apostle, okay? I'm walking into that. But what I would encourage you to do is get real bold with who you are. God won't mind. <laughs> he really won't. He's really encouraged when we just think, because it's not, the humility side to this is, it's, this is all about God, because I know what I can do, and it's not much. I've seen what I can do. I'm talking about what God's doing. So get bold about who you are, guys. Get real bold about, because my father says this about me. And I'm growing into it. And I, I don't walk around blatantly proud, prideful about it. If I'm called to be a leader, my gift is to use to be serving others. That's the privilege I have. See, it's all about that servant's heart. The humility changes it all. I go on to say, I'm a father in the faith, desiring to raise a generation that will radically live for God and transform our world. I'm a generous man because I have a generous God who abundantly provides more than I can ask or think for my needs and the work he's commissioned me to do. I have total confidence God is going to provide for us to do the work he wants us to do. Why? Because <clears throat> he's a generous papa who will give us the tools to do what we need to do. I'm in a relationship, this is you guys, with a dynamic body of believers. Yes, that's you. That's us. I ain't doing this alone who are spirit-driven, kingdom-minded, serious about fulfilling the purposes and mandates of God. You want to be that? That's what we're becoming. We're going to rock this place. There's a prophetic word on San Diego from Chuck Pierce that I've been running with for, for, for years, really, and became another focus, that we are a prototype city. How many of you heard that? I believe it. I believe it, I be and we're seeing it happen. I've, told, I've said this many times. People say, describe San Diego. It says, imagine a megachurch with no walls. Imagine one megachurch in this city connected through relationships. I don't know about you. That, that gets me excited. I love Bethel. I love Cheyenne up at HIM. And they're, they're, they're um, apostolic leaders. They're apostolic churches. But they are contained in one place. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but that's, that's a reality. What if what God's doing in San Diego is everywhere? Do you know one of the visions for San Diego? It's not just one fire. It's many fires all over the county. And when you stood back, all you could see was a smoke over the whole city. What if it's about the church of God really being mature, rising up in each of you, coming into your giftings and callings? That's what excites me. See, I go back to my original calling as a quarterback. God uses that to prepare us for our future. Bill and I have got this running joke. His is basketball. But I'm the point guard, and I feed him the ball, and he slams it. <laughs> He's a rim breaker. One of my biggest delights is giving the ball to someone else. You know, quarterbacks are usually the worst athletes. You ever see Philip Rivers? The guy can hardly run. He looks like a dork. <laughs> He's a great leader, and his whole job is to give the ball to somebody else. That's his job. And we all need to have that attitude. I want the glory to go. I want Clyde to emerge. I want to, I want to see him shine. That's our joy when we do that for each other. That's that honor that goes around. Okay? So, um, Clyde, can you pass these out? There's, there's your homework assignment. Let me, uh, let me continue with this. Just one each, yeah. So after I, I've kind of gone over this identity statement, here's what came out of that, guys. I started to think practically what I do. And what I love to do is release his transformational presence. I love it in worship when we get into that place, that sweetness, and the gifts get released. You know, when we do that, it just starts happening. I love that happen because as God's presence comes in, the gifts start flowing, and the body gets ignited. So that's kind of one of the things I love to do. And I love, in my gifting, I love to see that happen where the presence of God comes and the body gets in, ignited. So there's three things. Three titles or job descriptions I believe I have. One's a father, father in the faith. That just takes time. I've been at it for 40 years. So I'm almost 60. I'm a father. <laughs> I've got four kids, two grandkids. I'm a father that way too. But I believe I'm father in the faith. Secondly, I believe I'm a leader. Just always have been. I just I hang out with other leaders. It's, just, it's who I am. It's not a braggadocious thing. It's just I just know who I am. It's what happens. Wherever I go, I end up in some part leading. I'm confident in that. 
I want you to be confident in your gift. I want you to walk into a room going, I can do that because I, I, it's like I know God's got my back on that stuff. I just, I know when I put on a guitar, I, I know we can leap, go into the presence of God because God's got my back. He wants you to have that kind of confidence in your gifting and calling that when you step into it, he says, I got this. I mean, Papa's giving me downloads right now on how to do this. You ever had that experience? Some of you guys, the prophetic, you're astounding to me. You just go from person to person, boom, 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 boom. Because you know, you're just flowing. Papa's got your back. Father, leader, and a worshiper. And that breaks down to some specific things I do. So let me jump to, I need one of those too, Clay. Yeah. And we're going to close this up with a little bit of prayer. Did, did, did Mr. Henry leave? Is he gone for the night? Is he hiding out? He might have gone home. Is he around, Jamie? Do you know? Can you find him? Yeah. Tell him, tell him his presence is desired, is wanted. I'll just give you a brief one here, guys. This is, this is up to you to follow through. Let me, let, me, let me add this to it. One way not to despise the prophecy is, prophecy is just to get about it. Just get about it. Understand this. Prophecy has a practical side to it. Prophecy is not a magic bullet. I get a prophetic word. You know, I think in the body of Christ, we've kind of gotten a little Chrismania craziness that we, I got prayed for by so-and-so, and suddenly my whole life's going to change. And we get the disillusion when it doesn't change. What's that about? Because there's a process. There may be some steps we need to apply. Look at Abraham. Look at Jacob. The prophetic words they had, there was a process they walked through. Now, sometimes the grace of God, it can just be like that, and we love those times when it happens, but there's a fun part to embrace. Don't run from the process. Embrace it. Even if it's hard. I have found the harder it is, the better the blessing. <laughs> so when it gets hard, just bear and go, oh, I'm going after this. The devil's going to give you some resistance. Bring it. More the better. The more the better. So, just quick five points, guys. Review, review, review your prophetic words. How many of you got prophetic words? Hands up. Okay. Do you have them written down? Good. Do you review them? Do you know where they're at right now? Are they in a drawer somewhere? Are they in the back of your Bible? Good. Review them. Get familiar with them. Maybe ask the Lord, give me one, Lord, to really camp on right now. And dig into it. A lot of prophetic words maybe aren't that people give you a picture of something. Ask the Lord, Lord, are there some scriptures attached to that? What's the emphasis of that prophetic word? And begin to dig into it. Because you know what? Revelation will come because it's a word God gave you. And many times he's saying, you just scratch the surface. There's so much revelation I want to give you about who you are. Meditate on it. So review it. Review it. Look for recurring words, themes you'll begin to realize, boy, I, I keep getting this word. Joshua was told four times in the first chapter, be strong and courageous. Think there was a reason for that? Look for recurring words. Three, don't be discouraged with small steps. Sometimes the key to getting something done is just starting. Even if it's one word at a time, be patient. Trust that the Father wants this more than you do. He'll give you the grace for it. He'll show you how. Be creative in it. You know, if you're musical, get, a, get your guitar out. Put, a, put a, a phrase to your to your prophetic word. Write it out. Write it in your own words. You know, just ask Holy Spirit. This is a co-laboring with Holy Spirit. Invite him into the process. Lord, show me how to do this. Lord, give me your revelation on this. Number four, and this is a big step. Share it with others risky, huh? Share it with others and get them involved in the process. Would you pray for me about this? Don't be bashful. I know it sounds like I'm arrogant when I'm saying these things. I don't care. <laughs> That's how my papa sees me. I don't want to dishonor him by not believing what he says about me. Hello? Don't despise what your father says about you. If you're a precious daughter, you're a precious daughter. That's how he sees you. And the fifth one is be led by the Holy Spirit. There's a little bit more there, but uh, I really feel like we want to step into something here.
just remember this. It's a lifetime journey. It's uniquely yours. You are not alone. God's with you. So your assignment, guys, is find a way. Get your words out. Get familiar with them. Put them in a place where you can see them. Put them before you. Pray them. And watch what God begins to release to you. And watch the change that takes place. I believe that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the revelation of God's word for San Diego. And that's all of us as individuals.